And this evening, our, our first uh, presentation in the series is What's All the Fuss About Carbon? A Soil Perspective. Uh, Anthony Bly is soil field specialist with SDSU Extension, works with crop producers in South Dakota, uh, has a long history working with soil and plant science. Uh, we welcome him tonight uh, to to do this presentation. Anthony, I always say the podium's yours. I don't know if that's quite right for okay. a webinar. <laughs> Well, that's just great. Thank you, Fred. Um, yeah, we'll get this going. And and anyway, um, yeah, the you know the 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 cause for for this title um, kind of came about uh, through my interaction with a number of producers and agronomists over the last oh gee, um, couple three years at least. Um, you know, asking me what I thought about uh, selling their carbon or signing up with someone to purchase their carbon or whatever that might be. And, and uh, so that's, that's kind of how, how the title came about. And of course I'm a, I'm a soil scientist, so I had to give it a soil twist, but, but anyway, I'm going to start out with um, some books that you should read um, related to this topic. Um, the first one on the left, uh, the soil owner's manual is really an easy read. Uh, even, you know, for those of you that don't read a lot of books, it's uh, very short. Uh, it's it's easily written. And uh, uh, we recommend that for for as the first first kind of book for an understanding of, of soil function. And then, of course, the second book there in the middle is David Montgomery's book, The Hidden Half of Nature, uh, really kind of digs in uh, a little deeper Um in the you know in the explanation of of micro, microbiology's role in in soil functions and then the one on the right is an actual farmer's experience um on his regenerative ag journey on their farm and that's that's Gabe Brown from North Dakota and, and so uh, there's many other books too but I only really had room for 3 and I I just pick pick the pick the 3 that I thought were were a good starting point for everybody Anyway, I'm going to start out with some oh, what could be um, taken as some controversial type of data. Um, it's not meant to be that way in my presentation. What what my purpose is, is to kind of show you where we're at and um, and what what the world's seeing and thinking. And uh, uh, it's I like to call it reality. And, and we have to realize that. Uh, uh, in all of this mess or fuss, um, th this is what's driving it. And so uh, this is, uh, you know, carbon dioxide levels uh, back that, you know, the, the X axis there goes back to um, uh, 800,000 years ago. And uh, uh, they get that data from ice cores uh, drilling um, in, in the ice sheets. And the gases, the CO2 gases and other gases are trapped in, in the ice cores because ice is not a solid material. So so they can get that and plot that out and it all looks fine. And uh, but but in particular, we're really interested in the last the last 50 to 100 years. And and you can see there the the mark for 1950 is indicated and then the current level. And and so that drastic increase and that that's that's what's us alarming uh, scientists and and uh, and others around the around the globe, and uh, and and so that leads to the talk about greenhouse gases and greenhouse effect and all those things. And uh, I'm going to show that that last part of that graph cut out of there, and and you can see it's you know well above 300 and now well above 400 and and uh, roughly uh, 60 year time frame. So. You know, there's a lot of uh, 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 pointing fingers and blaming and all that stuff, but but it, it, this data is what it is. And I'm, I'm going to keep talking about this a little bit. I wanted to review the greenhouse gases there. Uh, of course, carbon dioxide is, is one of those balloons or one of those tags. Um, but there's several others as well. Methane, I think you hear that if you're in the livestock industry. You hear nitrous oxide if, if you're a user of nitrogen. 
Uh, ozone is, is a good thing when it's high up in the atmosphere, but it, it can be present lower down in the atmosphere. And so at that point, it's, it's a bad thing. Uh, the chlorofluorocarbons, um, you know, CFCs coming out of spray cans and, and other things, carbon monoxide, of course, and then sulfur dioxide. So there's many different uh, greenhouse gases, a lot of culprits and, and uh, 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 that help trap the light at, in, in our atmosphere. And so the greenhouse effect is really easy to understand. And I'm sure you've probably seen this many times over, but uh, for those that need a refresher uh it's you know the sun is energy coming to the planet and that light is reflected back and so the astronauts on the moon can look back at the earth and see it in visible light waves and so uh, we know there's a no, uh, a lot of energy being reflected back into space um i heard a statistic on tuesday uh at a meeting uh we we're talking about um solar panels and the uh, electrical engineer there said that in one day's time, the amount of uh, energy coming from the sun to the earth, if we could capture that all and bottle that up, that would be enough energy for the whole planet for one year. So it's a significant loss back into space. But what's happening as our atmosphere is building in, in greenhouse gases, some of that light is more of that light uh, is bounced back to the soil surface causing a heating and it's a very subtle change we're not talking things that that maybe you can even notice but but it, it's happening so that's a greenhouse effect and you know i went and did a little searching back and uh, you know i found in 1827 joseph furrier a french mathematician really talked about the greenhouse effect and and you know we have greenhouses where that's their intended purpose and so it's 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 nothing new it's 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 really uh very well known um and so it's happening on a global scale and then in the 1860s john tyndall really um studied the gases themselves uh by looking at different wavelengths of light and and how they absorbed or reflected that. And so there you go, way back before the turn of uh, uh, into the 1900s, we had a scientist even studying those gases. So um, this science is not made up or new or anything like that, and it, it's a real thing. So if we look at the distribution of these greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and the others, um, you can see that carbon dioxide is, is really the elephant in the room or the, or the big dog in the room. But, you know, if, if you're smart there and you're looking at my pie chart, you see that there's a PPM, a concentration, and then a percent. And so the PPM is the, the concentration of that gas in our atmosphere. And then the percent is, is the percent of that gas in the atmosphere. And so we can see that, you know, at only 1.77 PPM, methane is, is, is 16% of that. And so it has a more greater effect of, of increasing the effect, the greenhouse effect than, than CO2, but we're concentrating on all of those, um, you know, as an effort. So anyway, um, you know, where did it come from? Well, I, I have a, just a chart here on cars. Uh, the bigger the car, the more CO2 is emitted. That's not rocket science. And we don't need to dwell on that a lot. But, um, you know, there it is. And, and so, um, you know, we're all, we're all uh, guilty of this. And this pie chart really shows this, that we can't really point fingers at any certain group of people uh, for causing this problem any more than others. It's all our problem. And um, actually, I spoke to a group of producers today and uh use some of these slides in that presentation and and uh you know it's 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 reality and so uh we all need heat we all need roads uh we need manufacturing and construction uh our our economy is dependent upon upon all those things so looking at the soil now uh there's the fuss about carbon and co2 and other carbon-based greenhouse gases. But now the carbon cycle, as it relates to animal production, uh, that's that's what this cycle represents. Uh, if you look really hard at this, this figure, there's, there's no fertilizer application here. 
So there's a cycle cycle for that too. Okay. And we can, we can add that in here. It just makes it a little more difficult to look at. And I apologize. The, the, the soybean plant there is pretty nice. Looks good with the leaves on it, but the corn plant's just that green stem. So I, I don't know, don't know what happened to my graphic there, but that, that is the corn plant. Um, and we see the driver there, basically all life on the planet is that sun's energy uh, being absorbed by that plant and forming sugars, complex sugars, and exuding them into the soil for the soil microbes uh, to use. And, and, and at that point, I call that the greatest exchange. Uh, that's, that's where the microbes are bringing nutrients to the plant and the plant is taking those up and kicking out more sugars, more carbon uh, for those microbes. And so there's, there's the exchange, if you will. And basically, uh, that's what makes this, this world go. Uh, that plant is giving off oxygen for us and, and, and other creatures to breathe. And it's using um, uh, CO2 out of the atmosphere, which is good. Um, and you can see, if you look really close, the depiction of soil microbes there. Uh, there's a little blue arrow right in front of that tractor. That's oxygen going into the soil. And those microbes are also using oxygen um, and are using carbon dioxide and, and emitting oxygen as well. So uh, we throw that the livestock component there in the shed and, and we feed them uh, those feeds produced by that corn and soybean. And right away, you see that brown arrow going up. There's the methane uh, leaving. And also after that manure is applied to the field, there's some methane loss as well. So, so all of these things are happening. And it's it's a natural cycle, and and so science is is at work, uh, trying to figure out how to to reduce these things, become more efficient. I I don't think it's you know we can limit it, we can stop it, uh, uh completely. But but I think I think we can be more smart about this, and and um, and 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 reduce it. But that's that's the critical race that that you hear science talking about. So there's some things, um, uh, practices that, that we know are, are beneficial to reducing CO2, our greenhouse gas uh, emissions into the atmosphere. Tillage is one of those. Um, reducing tillage or completely stopping tillage will, will help reduce CO2 emissions into the atmosphere. The use of cover crops can help um, um, take CO2 out of the atmosphere, trap it into organic plant materials and uh, sequester other nutrients from the soil and, and release oxygen. And so that's why there's a huge uh, focus on cover crops. And then all of those that are bracketed there uh, um, and pointed out towards nitrogen, those are all nitrogen management practices that we can do or use to, to really reduce the nitrous oxide emissions into the air. So I'm going to go a little bit deeper into this and, and really get into my area. Um, those previous slides, I obviously stole from other places, uh, tried to give credit where credit was due. Um, but um, now I want you to focus on the soil health principles. And um, a big part of my career uh, involves soil fertility and testing research and um and lately, it's it, it, my career has been focused on on soil properties and, and and soil health principles. And so, there they are, the five five principles: uh, keeping that soil protected with an armor, and and we do that with crop residues left on the surface. Uh, having a growing root as much as possible uh, during during the growing season. Uh, what we've done is we've put corn and soybeans in the middle of that growing season, they're warm season plants. And so uh, there's brown periods before they're very active and growing and after uh, they're done uh, or they're complete and we harvest them. And so those brown periods, the, the, the native prairie really took advantage of the whole season, if you will. There were cool season plants that grew right away and there were warm season plants that flourished in the summer and then those cool seasons came back in late and so the whole growing season was used used by the prairie and and so our corn and soybeans are plunked right in the middle of that and we have these brown periods and we've kind of well we have we've broken the water cycle and that and that's led to a lot of 
other issues happening in the soil, which which I'm not going to cover today. But but anyway, adding diversity is is another uh, way to improve soil health condition. Uh, we get that through crop rotations, um, giving those microbes in the soil uh, more of a buffet, and that can come through diverse cover crop mixes. Um, those microbes aren't any different than us. Uh, if they had two items on the buffet, uh, at your favorite restaurant, uh, that'd be very disappointing. But you like to go to a buffet or a huge salad bar because you know there's going to be something there that you like. And and uh, the microbial diversity in the soil isn't any different than that. Um, uh, doing monocultures and monocrops have, have really um, um, wrangled our soil microbiology to a more heavily bacterial uh, dominance. And and so it it's 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 needing inputs such as nitrogen fertilizer uh, to function correctly, and what we've lost in our soil is that fungal component, and those other predator type microbes that feed off bacteria, and so as as protozoa, flagellates, and things like that. So uh, the ecosystem in the soil is very important for it to function correctly. And in a healthy fashion, and uh, I'll show you some some other proof of that in a little bit. So limiting tillage, obviously reducing that CO two emission, allowing the soil to form structure, allowing the soil to breathe better, allowing the soil to take in water, and that you know those that's closely related to the armor as well. And then lastly, livestock integration. I'm an agronomist, not an animal scientist. Um, but we have to realize that that livestock component really mimics the natural cycle uh, that that existed before before uh, pioneers came and converted all this land to cropland. Uh, the buffalo, the deer, the other the other animals that were there thriving off the prairie in the natural cycle, and our livestock systems can can fill fill that that part. And and so the livestock is important in cycling those plant nutrients back into organic forms, and and we appropriately put them back back on on the landscape. So just a little review about carbon and organic matter here. Um, you know, carbon is roughly fifty eight percent of organic matter. We can measure organic matter in the soil. We can measure organic carbon in the soil, total carbon in the soil. There's getting to be so many different carbon measurements now. It's just amazing. Uh, we got microbial carbon in the soil as well. Um, uh, microbial nitrogen. I, I mean, the the amount of soil testing that can can be used to uh, predict or, or monitor soil health is, is, is just amazing today, but soil organic carbon is, is really kind of the foundation to, to all of those. Here's just the, um, you know, the relationship of organic matter and carbon. It's, it's very, very tight. Um, uh, that line fits that those data really well. And, and so it's, it's kind of a non-arguable point. Um, it's, it is what it is. And we've known that for quite a while. Here's the nitrogen cycle. Um, you know, I looked at the carbon cycle there a little bit earlier and now the nitrogen cycle is, is what I want to kind of highlight on. Uh, it's got that cow in the middle there and it, it's showing, uh, inputs from fertilizer and atmospheric inputs. And there's gas in the atmosphere, nitrogen gas. It's a triple bond between, between two nitrogen atoms. It's very hard to break. And, and so uh, legume plants that allow uh, nodules to form on their roots, uh, the rhizobium bacteria uh, can break that bond. It's a, it's a really amazing, amazing feat. And so a couple guys by the names of Haber and Bosch uh, developed an industrial process to break that triple bond and 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 take that nitrogen from the air and make it into into synthetic fertilizers. I, I don't like that term synthetic uh, means you know human made or man made or however you want to refer to that, but it's nothing more than taking nitrogen from the air and putting it in a form that's more readily usable. So we can see that, but the importance of putting this nitrogen cycle up there, and I'm not going to get into the weeds with that, but but carbon, carbon's role. And that cycle 
is everywhere. Okay. So this has been happening. The cycle has been happening uh, other than the fertilizer application, but the rest of it has been happening uh, forever. And, and carbon is, is a very uh, strong part of that cycle. And so I, I just wanted to point that out. So if we think about carbon to nitrogen ratio in the soil, uh, um, this is, I probably should update this slide a little bit. It's one I've used for several years, but but I think it's really more important. Uh, uh, we, we have a lot of talk about cation exchange capacity and those things. And it's kind of an inside joke for me and some of the people I know that, uh, you know, let's manage C to N ratio and forget about that cation approach. But anyway, um, you know, the ideal ratio in the soil is, is roughly 24 to one. Um, the microbes need about 16 parts carbon for energy and eight parts uh, carbon for maintenance. Um, if we look at some of our crop residues that we may add back to the soil, there's vast differences. There's high carbon crops and low carbon crops. And I gave a couple examples there. Uh, vetch and alfalfa are, are low carbon crops, are high nitrogen crops. And so um, after those uh, materials have been added back to the soil, there's a net release or net availability of nitrogen. Uh, con contrasted to the wheat and the corn, uh, which is high in carbon, uh, when the microbes go to work on those residues, they run out of nitrogen and actually uh, go dormant with, with nitrogen as part of their system. And we call that nitrogen immobilization, where that nitrogen is not available. And so I think understanding uh, the carbon and the nitrogen relationship and, and that C to N ratio is going to be a big part of how we manage uh, crop production systems in the future. So this is really what I think a lot of farmers, um, uh, I showed this slide today in another presentation, and we spent a lot of time with this, uh, with the producers. And this is just one site that uh, SDSU soil fertility researchers have had in the past years. Uh, this is from 2018. And, and you know we put out rates of nitrogen, uh, 0, 60, 120, 180, and 240 in a replicated fashion. And then we grow the corn crop and we come back and we measure the yields. And then we uh, uh, determine how much N it took to maximize yield after the fact. That's the only way we can do that. It's after the fact. And then develop models and recommendations from all of that research we do. So this is one site. Uh, actually, it takes many of these to, to come up with a decent recommendation. And so at this site in 2018, uh, the mathematics shows that, that we needed a roughly 55 pounds of nitrogen to maximize yield. And you can see the yield is maximized there because the yield curve is flat, if you can see that. Um, so uh, that 55 pounds of N gave us 35 bushels of corn. Uh, I, I did put today's costs on there and prices for corn. And, uh, you know, that $38 is returning 218 bucks, which is a huge return on investment. Uh, this, this really is um, the holy grail of agronomy. If, if I or someone else knew or could predict what that number is for every field every year, had that, that, that power to do that, wow, uh, I wouldn't be here speaking to you tonight. I'd probably be doing some other great thing or whoever would discover this, but, but that's eluded science for years. That that's very hard to, to determine. But what I can tell you about this site is this site had been in 26 years of no-till and other good soil health practices for 26 years. And it had built its organic matter 5.4%. And so the nitrogen cycle here at this site is huge. And and taking a little bit off 50, 50 some pounds or just having to add that a little bit, the rest came from that nitrogen cycle. And, and so the amount of N we needed to apply as fertilizer is very low. Okay, so this is the impact of soil health. And in here is, is the chart that has uh, a number of sites um, from 2018 and, and uh, to 2022. And, and those, those optimum nitrogen rates 
are shown for each site. So for this site, it's 55. And that 55 came from my dumb just estimating and drawing lines, okay? But Jason Clark uses a computer program to do that for us. And so that 55 is actually this 53, okay? I was two pounds off in my in my visual estimation of doing that. But that's that 53. And so you can see all of these sites, and, it, and they vary from a group of zero down here all the way up to above 100 pounds. And so it's all over the board. And you can see why I said if, if a person or someone could predict that, um, that would be a very powerful tool and very valuable tool, but we can't. But what I can tell you from this graph is, is in this lower corner, the circle, those zeros are circled. We know some details about the, those sites. And, and those are the sites that we would call our leading soil health producers in South Dakota. Okay. That have been doing rotations, have been doing cover crops, have been doing no-till, have been trying to integrate livestock, um, have been trying their best. Um, it's not perfect, but trying their best to do those things. And so the soil health is paying off on those farms. So really, um, this graph can really almost show um, uh, poor soil health, one relying on a lot of commercial Add, add additions, nitrogen additions to, to really excellent soil health. That's really, that's the journey right there. And it doesn't happen in one year or two years or five years. It happens over a longer period of time. It's a big investment in, in into the soil. So a uh, study that was done um, in the area here um, shows the power of organic matter and its effect on corn yield. And, and, you know, for about every 2% organic matter in this study, the, the, that was 58 bushels of corn. So it's very important uh, to, to manage soil health well and try to build those organic pools in the soil. We know that tillage um, really has a negative effect on organic matter in the soil. Uh, we go from no-till here on the left all the way to more intensive mobile plow on the right. And we see that, that, decrease in the amount of organic matter in the soil. And we're just, we call that mineralizing, over mineralizing. I call it uh, stoking the flames or stoking the fire with tillage, if you will. It spurs on that additional microbial activity that breaks down organic matter and, and releases that carbon into the air. So I have an example of a couple different um, soils here, manage, management wise, the one on the left, would be what I call more of a typical conventional uh, approach. Um, and the one on the right would be a, a very um, a, 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 a purposeful uh, soil health approach with no-till and, uh, and some other practices. And you can see the difference, I hope. You can see the color difference on your screen. And you can even see the uh, uh, what I would call the texture. Of, of each of those soils in the, in those containers. The one on the left being very massive, big chunks of soil, we would call that structureless. It has no structure. And the one on the right, you can see smaller aggregates, uh, clumps. Um, some have called it almost chocolate cake consistency. Uh, breaks apart really nicely. Um, and, and so... Uh, he, he, that's the years of of focusing on on soil health and making that a priority on that farm. So the one on the right has higher organic matter than the one on the left. And these soils, I, I you know I didn't go miles apart to get them. Uh, they're right across the road from each other. So very similar soil types. Now I want to talk about cover crops. Um, and kind of wrap this up a little bit, but uh, um, cover crops have a lot of benefits. There's a number of them there on the screen. Uh, uh, they're really uh, numerous. Um, they can be very beneficial in a lot of ways. Um, of course, that's me and and I grow cover crops on our farm. And of course, uh, th those are kind of my trophies. You know, we were going out looking for that biggest radish or that biggest turnip. And, and, and that's what we found. Um, I'm not implying at all that 
that the brassicas are better than any other cover crops in building soil health. It's just really as an attention getter to get your attention. But I want to contrast that to the implement on the right. Um, oh, in my career, I just received my 30 year pin last year. Um, there's two periods in my career where these deep ripping machines um, saw a rise in popularity and, and, and producers uh, purchased those and, um, and tried to use them. And um, so my, uh, my thesis or my proposal is that cover crops are, are really way better at building soil uh, than that, that piece of steel, that piece of iron. And so, um, in fact, that piece of iron is probably can be more detrimental uh, in the soil used at the wrong time than it can be beneficial. And and so, uh, the cover crops, the living root. That's 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 one of those principles. Um, along every one of those roots, you can see here, even on the brassicas, there's soil hanging on. Uh, why is that? Well, that's where that great exchange took place. There's a uh, abundance of microbiology there. Uh, the microbiology are exhuming um, substances uh, uh, in their life cycles. And one of those is called glomalin. And glomalin was discovered in the 90s. It's really an organic type of glue. It helps hold sand, silt, clay, and organic matter together in clumps called aggregates. So those aggregates are forming there on those roots. Okay. And, the, and then the roots are penetrating the soil and developing more aggregates. That is the development of soil structure, which is, which is so important. So I'll talk about water infiltration a little bit, relate that to cover crops. Um, it's nothing more than the downward entry of water into the soil. It's described in inches per hour in this case. Um, uh, there's a number of other uh, comments there. Uh, uh, if there's macropores in the soil connecting it to the surface, we have even greater water infiltration to deeper depths. Uh, refer to that as kind of bypass flow, if you will. Uh, so we can actually fill the soil from the bottom up if we have good mac macropore structure, which is kind of amazing, an amazing thing. So what we did here is we pounded these rings into the soil. Uh, we have a no number of comparisons that we made. Uh, a no-till there in the upper right corner with cover crop, a rye cover crop, and then no-till without a cover crop. I'm not going to show all the other ones, but basically we had five different scenarios. The first two uh, I talked about or I showed the picture of are right there on the left. And, and the y-axis here is in seconds. And so um, it's better to have bars that are shorter than taller because that means we got an inch of water into the soil more quickly. So it could take another inch and another inch. And if you've uh, been around... Uh, lately, you know that these um, uh, rain rainfall events are coming more uh, intensely, uh, more rain in a shorter period of time. And so what we did is did uh, 1.14 inches and then the second 1.14 inches for a total of 2.28. So the cover crop had an effect on the no-till because we see the bars. Uh, just look at the bars. Uh, they're shorter, less time when we had cover crops with the no-till. So the cover crops did something there. But when we go to the tilled plots, the corn silage, fall tillage, no cover versus the corn silage, fall tillage with cover, the cover crops had a bit greater impact at helping those soils um, take in water. We can see that more clearly uh, by the difference in, in those bars there. So much less time uh, with the cover crops. And then on the far right, uh, we have uh, a field where corn stover was removed. It had it, they fall deep rip that field, and then they did a, a spring tillage pass. And you can see that that the effect of that tillage really increased the time dramatically for the the water to to enter the soil. And so uh, here we have the impact of tillage and cover crops. And the less tillage you do with cover crops is, is probably the most premier system there for getting, getting that water to infiltrate into the soil. Okay, a little bit more on cover crops here. Uh, I've tried to um, 
just focus on 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 some management scenarios that I think uh, 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 our dairy producers can use. Um, and so I have three different things here: uh, flying CRI into mature corn, into the mature phase of corn, can work uh, very good. It's um, it's been very successful. Uh, certainly, it can fail uh, if there's no rain that's received. And and I think I think uh, uh, any discerning person uh, would know that like last fall probably wasn't the time to do this. Um, you got to make those management decisions to be successful. Uh, of course, planting after silage harvest is is really a uh, an easy way to do cover crops. Um, you've got an extended period of time uh, to get those cover crops established and grow and really make a big difference. And then lastly, after cereal grains. And so, you know, wheat, oats, barley, uh, rye, triticale, et cetera. Um, there's even a bigger window uh, that's that's available there to grow cover crops. To harvest sunlight, convert it into a liquid carbon and store it in the soil. That's essentially essentially what's happening with 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 a cover crop. So I mentioned soil structure uh, and those tap roots. There's that picture of me again holding those trophies. Uh, the debate of tap roots, tap roots and fibrous roots. Um, you know, it's been a long, you know, long said that this pile driver radish really has the ability to break up compaction. And it does. It, it really does. But these fibrous roots are probably more effective. There's more of them. They find more channels and they separate more uh, aggregates in the soil and develop more aggregates in the soil. So they each have their point. I'm not saying one should be used over another. Uh, we need to des design our mixes according accordingly. So when to plant? Well, we need to consider that crop rotation. Uh, those cereal, cereal grains give us more options. The brown period that I discussed after corn silage is an awesome time to, to take advantage of a cover crop planting. Uh, the corn soybean rotation really has a lot less options. That's where the flying in of that cereal rye at corn maturity has been successful. Uh, it's got its set of issues, of course, but um, it's, it's, it's been, been very consistent uh, for, for many producers in South Dakota. Our warm season cover crops should be planted before August 7th. Uh, so warm season plants like corn, uh, I'll show you some examples. The cool seasons planted after or before, no, excuse me, before September 10th uh, because they can handle colder temperatures better. And then those winter annuals, you know, anytime between August and November is, is really uh, okay for those. We've had a lot of producers put in cereal rye with a no-till drill it never even came up, and there it is in the spring growing and, and looking uh, halfway decent. Here are the warm season and cool season cover crops. There's really a lot to choose from. Uh, it's kind of daunting how you make these decisions, uh, uh, but uh, they all have a purpose, and, and I'll go through kind of kind of how we should do that. So with these principles. Um Grass cover crops or grass dominant cover crop blends should precede broadleaf crops and broadleaf dominant blends should precede grass crops. Hence the corn soybean rotation, correct? A broadleaf, a grass, a broadleaf, a grass. Well, we need to, we need to think about that as we put our cover crops into those rotations. Um, we want to keep a living root in the soil as much as possible. And that's where those winter crops come in, the cereal rye or the winter wheat or the winter triticale. Uh, they grow right up until the end in the fall and they start growing uh, almost immediately in the spring. The, the, the cereal rye starts growing at 34 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, really, that's mimicking that prairie, isn't it? Uh, we need to We need to think about that. Soil and water and precipitation are so critical. Um, there's been a number of, of studies, and I, I, I've been involved in one as well, where we found that limited precipitation and cover crops really hurt our cash crop, our corn cash crop. Uh, we did not see that effect on soybeans as much, uh, but corn in particular. So in South Dakota, as, as that precipitation really drastically de decreases from east to west you know we need we need to focus on 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 um, um, being aware of that 
And I think there's kind of three scenarios that definite drought where you, you do not seed any cover crops, the definite wet times when you do obviously seed cover crops. And then that in, in between time can, is the hardest to really discern, but maybe a, a diversified approach is what should be taken on the farm and some fields seeded and some fields not. Uh, so you're half wrong and you're half right. <laughs> I don't know what else to say, but anyway, multi-species blends are good for diversity. Uh, uh, the mycorrhizae fungi that, that grow in good, healthy soils are very important and, and come from the fact that cover crops are seeded there, specifically oats and flax really have a good effect on that. Um, if I say this every time I talk about cover crops, because it's so important if you're a farm that grows any type of seed, grain for seed, oat seed, wheat seed, whatever, don't plant rye in your farm. Just just don't do it. Um, uh, rye found in wheat, uh, when you're trying to certify that sample, is, is, is a no-no and, and will re get rejected every time. But if you don't grow seed, Sarah Rye is an awesome, awesome cover crop and and, and you should try to experiment with that. If you're grazing those cover crops, think about that management, grazing half, leaving half. Um, you know, it, it, it's really up to you how you do that. But but the more you leave, I think the, you know, we know the soil is protected better and, and we need to we need to be concerned about that. And then lastly, keep them cheap. Jeez, I'm I'm all for that, keeping them cheap. And and the rule of thumb for me was under $20. Um, over the last many years, but now that we have a lot more demand for cover crop seed, you know, talk to me next year, that might, that $20 might be 40. I don't know, but a lot of programs coming down the line, supporting cover crops, how to take these out. You know, those annual cover crops can, can freeze. I'll let the winter do that for you. Um, as I noted there, I've seen rape turnips, crimson clover and annual ryegrass make it through the winter. Uh, 2014 was in particular uh, that very uh, mild winter where, where that happened. Um, the winter annual crops, cereal rye, winter wheat, uh, we're going to have to take them out with a burned down herbicide, you know, glyphosate. Uh, there's some others that could be used, but, you know, that can be done in combination with any pre-herbicide application as well. So it doesn't add add another trip. And and really the the hard part is when do you do that? When do you take it out? You know, if it's tending to be dry and it looks dry, take them out. Get rid of them. Start conserving moisture for your cash crop. If you're getting consistent rain and it looks like it's going to keep raining, I've planted soybeans into green standing cover crops and then killed them off later. Um, or just prior to planting as well. Use as much as that of that excess water as you can. Uh, it, the atmosphere is, is flushed with water in those wet years, that those soybeans will, will, will be fine. So lastly, um, I want to cover a topic here that I've kind of changed my, my thinking on. This is my opinion. Now I'm going to talk about, I've, I've got the uh, logos up there from a lot of different firms. Um, just ignore the South Dakota state logo <laughs> that's on the, on each slide, but South Dakota state's not wanting to buy any carbon. Don't get me wrong there, but, but a lot of, uh, a lot of groups want to buy uh, carbon from agriculture. And, you know, I thought that was a good thing at the beginning because I'm a farmer too. And anytime I can sell something and make some money, uh, you know, that's what farming's all about. And I thought, wow, another commodity that, that, that we can sell from the farm. And so I was excited, but as I have, have, have learned in the last couple of years, um, of, of dealing with this and thinking about this and thinking about why they want your carbon or my carbon, um, they're trying to offset, um, carbon emissions from some other you know, they're either going to resell your carbon or they're going to offset their own uh, carbon emissions. And, you know, the question is, in the future, you know, if these companies are, are concerned about that, their carbon emissions, as, as farms, 
as established farms, businesses, we're a business too. Are, aren't we going to be concerned about that as well? And, and, and wouldn't it be good for a farm to hold their carbon and offset their emissions that they uh, may have through the purchase of fertilizers or the purchase of diesel fuel or, or what have you. Um, I just want to throw that thought out there. And um, it's been my experience that, that uh, farmers aren't receiving enough for their carbon. And uh, um, I, I just kind of want to put that out there. It's, it's, it's totally up to you. It's, it's your choice on your farm. Uh, this is my opinion. Uh, but um, uh, we have a we have a research farm in South Dakota that's seeking to be energy uh, carbon neutral by 2026, and and so they can do that by 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 using soil health practices and and keeping that carbon in the soil and claiming that, okay, and so I I think uh, that this research farm Dakota Lakes research farm is very progressive in, in this in this area, and I. Um, I I think I think it's it's worth worth some thoughts. But again, you have to do what's right for your 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 operation. So in the future, you know, as I said, will we be required to be carbon neutral on each of our farms? And um will we be paid uh uh you know um through the payment of taxes or purchase of inputs? I mean, will will there be a charge or will there be a credit? And so I just want you to think about that. Um, so focus on that. Maybe, maybe you want to keep your carbon, you know, and, and think about why, why the world wants it, why they want your carbon. And, um, uh, so anyway, um, I think, uh, that's, that's my last slide here. And, uh, it's been a pleasure speaking to you tonight and hopefully I didn't go over too much. I think I had about 45 minutes there. So, um, there's my contact and, and, uh, I guess I didn't pay attention if there was any questions, but, but I'm sure, you know, there could be here. So, Anthony, thank you very much for the presentation. Since we have a small group, go ahead and unmute if you have a question and fire away. Yeah, I've got a question, Anthony. One of the things I hear, particularly in areas with real heavy, wet clay kind of soil that, if they plant cover crops or they do anything other than have black soil going into the fall, that'll warm up too slow in the spring. And we won't be able to get our crops in early enough in the spring. So these are heavy kind of wet soils. What advice would you have for farmers that that's what they think or you know, that's what they're saying? I, I totally understand that. And I, I think we know that that's um, probably a reality. Um so, so the soil health journey uh, for those producers um, needs to be augmented a little bit or adjusted a little bit. And maybe it's two or three steps forward and then one back. And maybe it's two or three more and one back. But, but if, if, if the journey to the, to the end point, to the, to the good soil health status of their soils, you know, it, it can be quite long, but, but we gain and then we really lose and we gain and then we lose. But if, Eventually, if we get there, I, I don't think that's going to be as much of a problem anymore because I I know a lot of producers on 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 clay soils, uh, river bottom soils um, in the eastern part of South Dakota that are making it work. And, um, uh, I, you know, I just got to say that that, you know, the practice does not make the farmer. The farmer has to make the practice. And, and, and that sounds like I'm heaping a burden on them, but that we all have to make those daily decisions. And, um, you know, I guess my advice is I believe, or I know that there are producers all across the United States doing this and there's gotta be someone in the local region, uh, where said grower is with heavy clay soils and, and, um, Golly, those those folks really want to share what they're doing, and uh, uh, I think you have to learn from those those folks. And that's not saying that I don't have all the answers because I, I it is that's what it's saying. I don't, but I realize that as an issue. So, planting green, um, you know, I, I'd give that a try. 
uh, having that, um, that green material there and, 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 and drilling beans into that is, is probably the, um, the most exciting time I've had working on the farm. It, it, it was so, uh, eye opening and, um, and I, I was just like, I can't believe this. This is just awesome. The tractor wasn't working as hard uh, in, in that green planting. It was just gliding right through. And and, and those beans just look great, uh, you know, during the growing season. So, um, so yeah, in our tougher soils, it, it may be two steps forward and a couple back or one or two, three forward. It, it's a journey. And, uh, I, you know, it's difficult. How long does it take to see results in that? Because I'm assuming based on some of the soil samples that you had in your slides that it might, it's not going to be your first year. You may not see a Correct. big improvement. What, what kind of expectations would you have? Well, I know I'm um, just talking about the clay soils in themselves. They have a really strong ability to aggregate quickly. Um, so I, you know, I, <laughs> in the right situation, it could happen really quickly, but you know, you get a wet year or two or three in there and, and things are gonna, you know, maybe go South for a while. But, um, you know, we started, uh, in this journey in the nineties on our farm, it was very wet. 93, the Mississippi was flooding and, and all of that. And we almost threw in the towel and gave up, but we just stuck with it. We just stuck with it. And we toughed it out. And, you know, personally, I am so happy we did that because I'm reaping the benefits from that now, uh, 30, 30 years later. And, and the next generation is, is going to have an opportunity to, to, to reach, reap those benefits as well. So it, it's a legacy thing. I, you know, it's a difficult thing. And cause we didn't get here. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that that all fields are just terrible and our situation is hopeless and all that. I'm not trying to paint that picture, but if we look at the progression of, of pioneers uh, arriving and breaking the soil and mach machinery getting bigger and tractors getting bigger and discs getting bigger, you know, we're at a point right now where the tillage intensity is, 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 is huge. And, and so um, turning that around in those, those effects, they'll, They'll see them, um, there'll be little bits and pieces in, in the journey. You'll say, wow, that, that's really something that, that, that happened. And, and, uh, you know, we're going to do this again, or, you know, Hey, you know, we'll, we'll have to modify something to make that work better the next year. It, it comes with its set of problems, just like tillage comes with it problems. I mean, if, if I talked about all the problems we had on the farm when we did tillage, um, you know, we joke. We joke uh, amongst friends. Uh, oh, you remember back when, when we dissed and then we plowed and then we drug and then we drug it again. And dad said, I'll go hit it again because it's too lumpy. Oh, those problems with tillage, right? Well, changing a system has its problems too. And 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 there's a lot of folks out there that have done it. Uh, we have a, a mentor a mentor program in South Dakota. I, anybody can join this thing, uh, Growing Connections is a, is an app that we've developed uh um you know we we tr we try to provide a helping hand as much as possible any other questions um maybe caitlin you know this or anthony how are they going to be evaluating so there's these payments as you mentioned anthony everybody wants you to sequester carbon how are they going to be measuring that? Are they just going to be measuring organic matter and kind of doing some calculations? Uh, maybe this isn't your wheelhouse, but I, I think those are some of the questions I get on farms. Yeah. Um, a number of those firms are taking different approaches. Um, um, and, and I can't obviously know the approach that they're all taking. Some are actually doing a more uh, a directed approach for sampling. Um, and, and, and showing that there's either a carbon increase or decrease. Others are doing more of a, a broad brush type approach where they sign up a lot of farmers and they do minimal sampling. And it's more about, we know that practices lead to more carbon and they're using modeling uh, to, to arrive at a number. 
And, and so there's, there's all of these approaches going on <laughs> and, and, um, and it's downright confusing. Uh, producers are confused. And I think uh, when you send a confusing message into agriculture, especially farmers, uh, they're, they're going to hold back. And I think we've seen that uh, in talking to a number of producers around South Dakota, they haven't made these decisions. And, 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 the, and the more, the more confused they get, the more they're not going to. And, and so um, I'm not judging their intellect or anything like that. It's confusing for me. I'm not saying I'm smart. It's confusing for everybody. And so, um, uh, so yeah, their companies are using soil sampling. They're doing that. Some aren't, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a hodgepodge kind of mess. Yep. Anthony, one of your statements was about changing the bacteria in the soil. And you mentioned that oats is a good thing to put fungals in. Yes. What else is out there that can help change and get uh, some of these other uh, microbes invested into your soil? Sure. You know, uh, ARS, Dr. Shannon Osborne at our ARS uh um, site here by Brookings, um, looked at a number of different crops and their effect on mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. And the, the mycorrhizal fungi is a um, organism that actually lives in the outer uh, layer of the root. And um, the plant allows it to live there. And then it sends out um, hyphae, kind of like small root hairs, but much smaller than that. And they can become interconnected. And, and the plant uses that relationship with that mycorrhizae and its hyphae to obtain nutrients and even water has been shown uh, to, to come to the plant. Um, so we know that oats and we know that flax are, are really beneficial for promoting uh, mycorrhizae fungi in the soil. Now for phosphorus release, uh, we know that buckwheat is really good at extracting um, unavailable soil phosphorus. And, and so those are the three uh, main ones that I know of. I think as we um, look at, at uh, microbes in the soil even more and more, uh, there are labs that are really doing a lot of detailed work with that. I think we're going to discover um, microbe-specific, uh, plant-specific relationships even more. I, I really... I really have that confidence. So, in one of your early slides, you talked about this uh, carbon nitrogen ratio, and you put those ratios for some of our current traditional crops. Uh, are there some crops that you, you know, some forbs or radishes or some of these other crops that you either like because of that ratio or shy away from? Sure. I mean, if you plant uh, too many uh, uh, broadleaf uh, brassicas um, on a field, you can, you can make the residue disappear uh, because what you're doing is, is supplying uh, the soil microbiome uh, with a su sufficient amount of nitrogen uh, needed to break down that carbon source, plus the carbon uh, from the residues that were there from previous crops. And, and we know this to be true uh, because we've seen that effect in, in, in research that's been done. Uh, like kale, for instance. Uh, uh, if you planted a whole stand of kale, uh, your residues, your kale and your other residues would disappear uh, very drastically. And so, so managing that carbon and nitrogen ratio or understanding just the basics of it, you know, what plants have high carbon and what plants don't and, and, and where we need more carbon and where we need less is very important. But, um, you know, I like a blend, uh, when I, when I, um, calculate a carbon cover crop mix, I mean, um, I like a number of different things. And uh, uh, that's that buffet. I'm trying to build uh, the microbial populations in the soil and the diversity of that. So I think that's very important. Any other questions? If not, uh, thank you again, Anthony. You're welcome. And
remind folks that uh, Monday, February 13th at 7 p.m., we have uh, Caitlin Briggs will be uh, talking to us. Uh, she was actually present this evening on the uh, program. So I apologize for the confusion with the passwords, but we are recording this and we in fact will have that up as soon as possible for folks. So thank you again. Look forward to seeing everybody on February 13th.